the Americas were the final continents that humanity discovered, and the early settlers were an extremely tough people, that first had to endure the frozen Arctic. In order to survive, the people who would eventually conquer the Americas developed some peculiar adaptations, and it's possible that these people were separated from the rest of humanity for 15,000 years. A small group of explorers stood on the brink of a new world. The Americas, a 15 million square mile region to the south, contained vast plains, dense rainforests, and massive mountain ranges. A remarkable adventure had just come to an end, which was the only reason an epic journey was about to start. These early explorers in America had spent centuries eking out a living in the barren areas just south of the Arctic Circle, before making the journey south. Global temperatures fell once they got to the north, and the weather got even worse. These original explorers chose to stay put in the face of deteriorating circumstances, spending thousands of years apart from the rest of humanity. Now that their fate has been revealed, it is evident that something remarkable occurred during those years. It turns out that the unusual adaptations, that the people who would eventually conquer the Americas developed to survive, can be used to identify their descendants today. When did these people first arrive in the New World? We don't know for sure. According to general agreement, the first Americans arrived only 15,000 years ago. Additionally, it is widely accepted that they traveled through the then dry land of Beringia, a region centered on the Bering Strait, between Siberia and Alaska. This suggests that a subarctic odyssey marked the start of the history of the first Americans. Hominins have lived in Europe and Asia for almost two million years, but it doesn't appear that any of the earliest humans, such as Homo erectus, Neanderthals, and Denisovans, ventured much north of 55 degrees north, roughly parallel to the tops of what are now Ireland and Kazakhstan. There are plenty of reasons not to do it besides just the cold weather. Higher latitudes have fewer animals, which makes hunting more challenging. According to available evidence, modern humans, not our extinct ancestors, entered northern Eurasia first. It was probably necessary to wear tailored clothing to deal with the cooler weather. Snares also provided a solution for the dispersed prey. They are essentially automated hunting tools, that operate around the clock, to help people exploit areas that span thousands of square miles, and are still used by modern Arctic residents. Undisputed evidence of human activity from 45,000 years ago can be found in northern Eurasia. The archaeological record actually starts at a 32,000-year-old site in the Arctic Circle. Archaeologists have discovered hundreds of stone and bone tools, including sewing needles, along the banks of the Yona River in Siberia, at the western tip of Beringia. People who lived close to the Yona River hunted birds, woolly rhinos, and reindeer. Arctic hares were also caught, probably for their fur, if contemporary Arctic populations are any indication. But life wasn't always miserable in Beringia. Numerous beads made of ivory and bone have been found at the Yona site, proving that the people who lived there had time for artistic endeavors. Additionally, decorated ivory strips, that may have been used as hairbands, and shallow ivory dishes that may have been used for ritual purposes were discovered by archaeologists. Two tooth fragments from a human were also found at the site and both of them still contain ancient DNA. The children who had the teeth belonged to a group that was related to modern Native Americans, but not their direct ancestors. The size of the community was the discovery that changed everything. These children were so genetically different from one another that there may have been more than 500 Yona people. Indeed, it is a shocking discovery. We might anticipate that the population at the Yona site was small, isolated and inbred, because it was far from the southern centers of human activity during the late Stone Age. But it was a pretty strong and healthy group. This implies that some migration into and out of Beringia occurred, maintaining genetic diversity among populations there. However, despite the fact that Siberia and the Americas were then connected by dry land, and despite the fact that this group may have been flourishing, there is no solid evidence that these people pushed even further east into North America. Instead, they remained there for many generations. Then, the last glacial maximum, a period of extreme cold, 
began to sweep across the planet around 30,000 years ago. North America was covered in ice sheets, and the passage from Beringia to the New World was blocked by ice. About 15,000 years passed before things started to change and the route was reopened. At the start of this time, the Yona site was deserted. It appears that other tribes remained in Beringia. Inconspicuous genetic differences between East Asians and Native Americans, that date back thousands of years before people arrived in the Americas, were first discovered by geneticists a decade ago. The geneticists put forth a solution, perhaps the Native Americans' ancestors had lived in Beringia, and had become isolated due to a drop in temperature 30,000 years ago. That is because polar deserts in Eurasia and ice sheets in North America prevented them from traveling south. Theoretically, these individuals could have been isolated from the rest of humanity for 15,000 years. This gave them plenty of time for random genetic drift to endow them with unique DNA, prior to arriving in the new world. Although anthropologists now believe it didn't start until around 24,000 years ago, when conditions got really bad, and that it only lasted 9,000 years at most, the majority of researchers still acknowledge that there was an incubation period. But regarding the precise location of this period of isolation, there is controversy. Some are convinced that the ancestors of modern Native Americans did move south, as conditions deteriorated, and spent the last glacial maximum close to Lake Baikal at about 53 degrees north. Even DNA from a boy who passed away there 24,000 years ago is available. He was related to the Native American founding population, like the Yona, even though they were not his immediate ancestors. Other researchers are adamant that the incubation took place in Beringia itself. They contend that the area's isolation makes it more likely for a population to remain there for centuries. In fact, there is genetic proof that this occurred to other mammals during the last glacial maximum, including elk and brown bears. Global sea levels sharply decreased as Earth's climate began to cool, and ice sheets started to form. The sea level may have been 100 meters or 330 feet lower than it is today by 28,000 years ago. The result was the creation of new land, covering thousands of square miles in south-central Beringia. Climate models and pollen records suggest that the subarctic was humid and mild before 30,000 years ago, possibly because Pacific currents pushed warm air over it, despite the fact that most of the subarctic became cold and arid after that time. There is no other place on Earth where there was such a large expansion of viable habitat at the height of the last glacial maximum. According to one estimate, tens of thousands of people may have lived in Beringia at the height of the last glacial maximum, due to the region's size and favorable climate. But there would have been significant obstacles. Anyone living today above 46 degrees north will have a difficult time getting the sunlight they require, to start vitamin D synthesis in their skin during the winter. You won't receive enough ultraviolet light exposure even if you are outside in the open. Adults can largely overcome this issue by consuming vitamin D-rich foods like oily fish, but nursing infants are at risk of developing vitamin D deficiency, which can, among other things, weaken the immune system and result in skeletal issues. Thus, the original Native American population evolved as a result of being isolated in Beringia. Researchers found that many contemporary Native American populations carry unusual variants of the FADS gene family. People with these variants are better able to process the diet that subarctic communities typically consume, which is high in protein and fatty acids. The variants may have been naturally selected in the Native American founder population during its isolation in Beringia. With all of this study, a picture of life on the American frontier is being created. But up until recently, most people only thought of the Beringian incubation as a curious prelude to the history of the first Americans. According to this theory, the real epic began around 15,000 years ago when the ice sheets began to melt and a small, genetically homogeneous population began to migrate from Beringia into the New World. The original population had divided into two distinct Native American subpopulations by 14,600 years ago. One of them, known as Ancestral B, appears to have remained largely confined to the far north of North America, where many of its descendants still reside today. 
The second, the ancestral A group, produced the Clovis, a well-known prehistoric culture in North America, and over the following few millennia, the group also migrated south into Central and South America. Or at least, we believe that. But researchers have discovered that during the incubation period, the Beringian people split into different subpopulations. This indicates that a number of genetically unique groups migrated to the New World. The DNA found in the bones of two children, who were buried in Alaska 11,500 and 9,000 years ago, provides the most convincing proof of this. Both are members of the ancient Beringians, a genetic subgroup that diverged from the rest of the Beringians around 22,000 years ago. It's not as unbelievable as it may seem that this occurred in Beringia, and the two subpopulations subsequently avoided mixing for thousands of years. The researchers note that during the last glacial maximum, tree species in Beringia experienced a comparable population fragmentation. The populations might have become isolated as a result of individual adaptations to local microclimates. There is currently no proof that the ancient Beringians had a significant impact on the New World's population. The ice sheets appear to have persisted in the Beringia region even after they had receded, eventually dissipating when Native American populations from farther south pushed back north into Alaska. But it's possible that other subpopulations split off during the Beringian incubation as well. But others might have had a stronger desire to travel. Researchers revealed that the mixed people of Mexico have a distinctive genetic signature from their neighbors. One theory is that around 9,000 years ago their ancestors interbred with a mysterious group that appears to be another subpopulation that originated in Beringia, about 25,000 years ago. The mysterious population Y is another factor. Genetic researchers reveal that a few members of the Soru and Karatiana ethnic groups who live in the Amazon share an intriguing genetic connection with some indigenous Australians. The most straightforward theory is that this originated in Population Y, a prehistoric East Asian group that was related to the first Australasians, and contributed genetic material to the New World via Beringia. Population Y also gave rise to the Australasians. However, because there are no traces of Population Y in the ancient DNA of Beringians or North Americans, some scientists have started to question its existence. Then it was discovered that a person who passed away in eastern Brazil 10,400 years ago had DNA that was similar to that of an Australasian. The person belonged to the ancestral A line of Native Americans, who as far as we know arrived in South America and settled there. Geneticists believe the two groups met and interbred after they reached South America because a population Y DNA hasn't been discovered in ancestral remains in North America. This, according to some, might suggest that the first people to push into South America were a population Y Beringians. If so, the early inhabitants of those places, like those at 14,200-year-old Monteverde in Chile, left a genetic legacy that we now only see in a small subset of Amazonians. It is a theory that fits with the growing realization that South America's population history was more nuanced than previously believed. A small group of Beringians stood on the brink of a new world about 15,000 years ago. They would eventually produce enormous works of art in the Peruvian desert of Nazca, start the human race's love affair with chocolate in the forests of Ecuador, and establish great civilizations in Mexico. The genetic heritage of those remarkable people still exists in the Native American populations of today.